let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalm 90 once again. Psalm 90 is where we will begin. I'm going to add an extra verse that I noticed this week that I think is um, helpful as well. So a little bit of a fresh introduction. Psalm 90, and we'll read our springboard verses, if you will, for this uh, study. Verse number 9, we'll just start in verse 9, Psalm 90. It says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore and ten, that is seventy. And if by reason of strength there be fourscore years, that's eighty, Yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. We can all say amen to that, right? It is soon cut off. Uh, we have a short time here. God's given us uh, a short space of time. The book of James says, what is your life? It is a vapor uh, that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So God has given us just a small, just a small amount of time in the scope of eternity, to live on this earth. Amen? In the verse, he gives the timeline of 70 to 80 years. Uh, That's about the average lifespan of a human being, and uh, that's that's what we've got. Amen? Uh, Now, not everybody has that. This isn't a promise everybody's going to make it to 70 or 80. Uh, We all know that's not the case, right? Many people that we know and love have gone on to be with uh, the Lord or have gone on out into eternity. Uh, long before then. And so you and I have been given the privilege of today and we need to make the best use of it we can. Let's look in verse uh, verse number 12. Verse number 12 of Psalm 90. It says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Now take your Bible and turn to Psalm 39. Psalm 39, another verse that I wanted to add to our study. While you're reading, or while you're turning, I'll go ahead and read a couple of quotes. A.W. Tozer said that when you kill time, you have it has no resurrection. We, we noted that earlier. Um, when you kill time, it has no resurrection. Look in Psalm 39 and verse number 4. Psalm 39, 4. The Bible says, Lord... Make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. That's a good verse. What the psalmist is saying is that, God, if you will give me a glimpse at the brevity of my life, it will teach me how frail that I am or how how weak. How, uh, how, how without strength that I am. And if you and I would understand that, God could really begin, begin to use us then. Amen? Uh, when you're mighty in your own eyes and when you think you have all strength and all power and you think you're going to live forever and you're invincible, you're of little use to God at that point. But when you realize that our life is short on earth and that, that we have to give our days to Jesus, we give our days and our life to God as small as it is and as small as I am, it's at that point that God can begin to use you for his service. Amen? And so that's, that's something extra I wanted to add. But we're looking at this sin of idleness. Go ahead and take your Bible and turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Excuse me, Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm going to fly through. I'm not going to spend as much time on the introduction. We looked, first of all, at God's intention for our time. What is it that God wants us to do with our time? We looked at Genesis 2, where the Bible says that God made man, or took the man that he had made, and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And I told you that God made man, and he gave him a job. Uh, and that's something that every man needs. Amen. Men need to work. Uh, God made a man and saw that man without a job and said, hey, that's not a very good man. He needs a job. Right? Uh, and so that's that's what we saw God's intention for our time is for us to work. We looked at Ephesians uh, chapter 5 about redeeming the time, that is taking time and improving it to the best advantage. We looked in even in chapter 6 of Ephesians where we are to work as unto the Lord. So we work as if 
we are working for Jesus uh, because we are working for Jesus. Amen. And then we looked in Hebrews 6 about how that uh, God does not want us to be slothful, but to be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I talked about being slothful is, is inactive, it's sluggish, it's lazy, it's indolent, it's idle, and God does not want us to be that. Amen. And then we looked in Romans chapter 12 where the Bible says not to be slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And God wants us to take the time that he has given us and serve him with that time. Listen, you can take the time that God has given you and you can spend it any way you want to. Right? It's up to you. But, but what we all should do is choose to take the time that God has given us and spend it for Him. Spend it serving the Lord. And that is the will of God for our life. It's to, it's to determine what He wants us to do and to spend all of our time doing that for Him. But then we, start, then we started with the second point, which is man's disobedience and subsequent consequences. And there are consequences to our actions. Amen. Everything you do, there's a consequence for it. Uh, we also noted one more thing, and then we'll get started uh, with our with newer material. But we noted that idleness, I talked about two different kinds of sin. I said there are sins of omission and commission, right? Sins of commission are things that you do, and it's a sin because you did it. Sins of omission are sins that uh, you, you don't do what you're supposed to do. So, so you're supposed to pray, but you didn't. That is a sin of omission, prayerlessness, right? You, you don't read the Word of God. That's, that's something that you omitted to do. You failed to do it, and therefore that's a sin. But idleness is this special category of sin in that it's a sin that you commit when you omit. When you don't do what you're supposed to do, in that moment of omission, you are committing the sin of idleness. And so it's a very uh, interesting sin, if I can use that phrase. It's, it's an it's a, uh, individual kind of sin that is unique uh, in itself. And idleness, as we're going to see here in a little while, is a gateway sin. People talk about marijuana as being a gateway drug, right? It is that you, you start with that and then you branch off to other things. That's what it means to be a gateway. But idleness is a gateway sin because when you begin to omit, you begin to commit, and by the commission of idleness, you will then branch off into committing things that you never thought you would do. And we'll see that throughout uh, the course of the class today. Amen. Points in Proverbs is what we began looking at. We looked in Proverbs chapter 6. I believe I told you to turn there. Proverbs 6 in verse number 6 where he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, ruler, or uh, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? I wonder how many people thought about that this week. I did. Uh, I know we spent some time looking at this last week, but this is a wonderful question. How long wilt thou sleep? We got very practical last week talking about uh, the, the amount of time that people sleep. And, and some people don't sleep enough, but I think that's a far smaller number than the category of people who sleep too much, right? Uh, some, you don't have to say amen, I guess. I was going to ask for it, but I, that's, a little, that's, a big, that's a big ask. Uh, but how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? And then he says, when wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? So not only how long do you sleep, but what time do you get up? When wilt thou arise? Um, and I think it'd be good for all of us to take a moment and consider, is our sleep pleasing to God? The Bible says he gives his beloved rest, right? So, so God wants us to sleep, but you can take what God has given you as a blessing, the blessing of rest, and you can sin with the blessings of God. Surely you're all aware of that. You can take something that God has given you as a blessing, and then you can turn around and sin with the blessing. God help us not to do that. Amen? God has blessed us with so many things. We've compared this uh, idea of time to money because in our text verse, he says that we spend our years as a tale that is told. And I talked to you about how that when we think about spend, we think about money. Uh, and, and, and that's obviously applicable and appropriate. But, but the most valuable thing that you and I have is not money. It is our time. Your time is far more valuable than money. And so the, so, so we, the way that we spend our time, we should 
we should be more careful. We should be more diligent about how we spend our time than even we are our money. But so many of us don't do that, right? It's so easy not to do that. It's so easy to, to, uh, to, to budget out your, your finances before you budget out your daily life, but God has given you the day as a blessing, and we are to ensure that we, that we serve God with the blessing, that we don't sin with the blessing, but that we serve with the blessing instead. Amen? Then we look at the next part of the verse, verse number 10. Verse number 10, he says, Yet a little sleep, yet, uh, excuse me, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come. Uh, as one that travaileth, and I want as an armed man. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 10. We're just going to be looking at a bunch of verses in Proverbs. You should be going to the right. Amen. The book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10. And we're going to see that phrase here again, here in a little while, that um, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Uh, the Word of God brings that up again here shortly. But Proverbs chapter 10, look in verse number 26. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 26 says, As vinegar to the teeth, and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. This is what Matthew Henry had to say about this verse I thought was really interesting. He said, Those that are of a slothful disposition that love their ease and cannot apply their minds to any business, are not fit to be employed. We could all say amen to that, right? You see a whole bunch of people that are employed, and, and, and you, you question, and you think, how in the world are you holding down a job? Like, I just don't understand. How, how is it? When you consider the fact that you're of a slothful disposition, that you love ease, you can't apply your mind to any business, how, how is it that you are employed? Matthew Henry says they're not fit to be employed. No, not so much as to be sent on an errand. And that's what this verse is talking about. So is the sluggard to them that send him. So we have a, a, a slothful person. We have an idle, lazy person who is being sent on an errand. But he says when they're sent, they will neither deliver the message with any care, nor will they make haste back. Such therefore, and he makes a strong application here, such therefore are very unmeet to be Christ's messengers. He will not own the sending forth of sluggards into his harvest. That's a very strong application. What he's saying is, we read this verse and we say, well, see, this lazy guy, uh, you know, he's, he's smoke to the eyes of those that send him. He's vinegar to the teeth, vinegar to the teeth. It damages the enamel, smoke to the eyes, obviously causes impaired vision, it can cause redness and annoyance and irritation. You ever been annoyed and irritated by a lazy person, by people who are not willing to work, not willing to, to spend their time wisely? Well, well, he's saying the same way that you feel about that secularly is the same way that, that we should all feel about it spiritually. He said a person like that, a person who meets that description, is not worthy to be sent forth into Christ's harvest. Amen? We're, we, we have a harvest. We have a, a job. We have a task to accomplish. We're to, be, we're to be ambassadors for Christ, right? We're to be His messengers. We're to be, we are the church. That means we're His body. We are His physical representation on earth, and yet many of us are idle. And He says that in doing so, you're smoke to the eyes and you're vinegar to the teeth of those that sent us. And the one who sent us is God. God is the one who sends us forth into his harvest. He, 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 he saves us, he fills us with the Spirit of God, and then by the Spirit of God we are sent out to minister and to work and to labor, and so many of us are not faithful in that service. Amen? Turn to Proverbs chapter 12. Turn to chapter 12. Excuse me, verse number 24. Now again, some of these I'm just going to read. I'm not going to elaborate on. Some of them I'll add some commentary. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 24. It says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Very simply, hard workers get promoted. Idleness will keep you at the bottom. Right? I don't think I have to elaborate too much on that. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. The slothful man 
roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. I want to take a moment with this. Now, again, when you're reading the book of Proverbs, you're finding these, these short uh, one verses. Many of them are standalone verses, but they are principles to live by. This book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. And so all of these verses, all of these Proverbs are truths to live by, eternal truths that do not just apply in one specific instance, but they're, but they're a broad commentary on life on how it is that we live in, in every area of life. So when this verse says that the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, what he's saying is that slothful people profit off of other people's labor. Amen? That's what happens. A, a, a lazy person, a, a, an idle person, they, they roast not that which they took in hunting, Meaning, they don't go out and provide for themselves. They have to be provided for. Other people have to provide for them. Welcome to America, right? They roast not which they took in hunting. Essentially saying that, that there are so many people who have to be provided for because they can't provide for themselves. Not that they, not, excuse me, not that they can't, that they won't provide for themselves. They, they, they have the ability, they have the strength. Listen, I'm not talking about everybody who's ever been on welfare. I'm not, I'm not mad at that. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. There are, there are some people who need a safety net, who need uh, a communities and people to build them up and help them and get them back on their feet, and that's all well and good and fine, but that's not supposed to be a permanent lifestyle. It's not supposed to be a permanent lifestyle. And we have a ton of people who, who they roast not which they took in hunting. Meaning, meaning, Brother Jeff, you go out and get it, and then I'll eat what you got. That's socialism. That's communism. That's what that is. That, that, that somebody else does the work, and you get the benefit. Isn't that irritating? Isn't that irritating? The New Testament says that if a man will not work, neither should he eat. That's what the Bible says. And we can all say amen to that. We can say, you know what, those sorry Democrats, all them sorry you know, socialist communist policies that are stealing our freedom and, and all these lazy people who are getting all these benefits and we can complain and we can gripe. And listen, I'm all for that. That's perfectly fine. But listen, there are people who spiritually do the same thing. I'm talking about how this verse applies not just to one area. This is a broad principle of life. You know, there are people in the church house who roast not which they took in hunting. Who they didn't provide for it, but they but they but they're happy to receive the benefit. You know how the lights are on this morning? Somebody went hunting. Amen. Somebody made a provision. So, 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 somebody did some work. Somebody did some labor and they decided to give. And you and I are all benefiting this morning from the fact somebody went hunting. Somebody decided to provide. Not just to receive, but to give. Thank God for those who give. Amen? And because there are those who are willing to work, there are those who are willing to labor, they're willing to sacrifice, then there are those who are able to roast that which they did not take in hunting. Wouldn't it be good if everybody went hunting? Wouldn't it be good? Again, hold on, I can turn around and apply it physically and everybody will say amen. It's getting quiet in here now. I, if I say it physically, everybody says amen. Yeah, the, the, the welfare, yeah, all the lazy bums that won't work and, you know, I'm not paying their bills. It applies spiritually as well. Right? Hopefully there was more than one person who prayed for the service today. Hopefully there was there was more than one person who who who, who tried to study and tried to tried to, to come to church with a fire and come to church with some worship and with some praise and listen, everybody's gonna get the benefit from that, but we shouldn't all just come to church to be takers. We should come to church to be givers. We need to, we need to go hunting. Amen. We need to provide. 
We don't need to just roast that which other people hunt. Amen? A few years ago, we, I, I always preached in the nursing home ministry. I'll say this and move on. I preached in the nursing home ministry down here. Now Brother uh, Drew and uh, Brother Sam do that weekly. Praise God for that. Amen? Listen, they were already, they've already been in church today. They already have been through an entire church service, an hours-long service of prayer and singing and preaching and worship. Praise God for that. Amen? Well, I did that for many, many years. And there was a lady there named Miss Beulah Turner. And Miss Beulah Turner would put a dollar in my hand every week. Every week. I'd show up, and she'd put a dollar in my hand. She said, that's for the offering down at the church. Miss Beulah Turner gave $52 to Resurrection Baptist Church every year. $52. You and I are, we're, we're roasting, what we're, we're getting to partake of what she gave. Amen? God forbid that somebody who's never stepped doors in Resurrection Baptist Church gives more to Resurrection Baptist Church than people who do step foot in Resurrection Baptist Church. Amen? Let's go hunting today. All right? Praise the Lord. Look in verse, excuse me, look in chapter 13, verse number 4. I'll get off of that. Chapter 13, verse number 4, doesn't need a lot of commentary. We'll just read it and move on. The Bible says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent should be made fat. There's another verse here in a little bit that's very similar to that, and I'll make some commentary there. Look in chapter 15, verse number 19. And what I want to show you by reading all these verses, you say, well, why is he just reading the verses? Because I want to show you how often the Bible speaks about this subject. And if we're going to preach the whole counsel of God, if we're going to study and, and, and show ourselves approved and all that stuff, then we're going to need to talk about things relevant to the amount they're found in the Bible. That means if the Bible's chalked full of something and we never talk about it, we're not doing it right. We're not doing it right. So the Bible's chalked full of this, so we need to talk about it. And I'm going to illustrate that by reading all these verses. Look in chapter 15, verse number 19. The Bible says, and this is a very keen, a very wise observation. Verse 19. The way of the slothful man is as an hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. This is what I believe that this verse is saying. When it says that the way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns. You can imagine how difficult it would be to, to walk through. It talks about his way. That means his path, right? So the path he's walking down is like a hedge of thorns. What he's saying is everything is difficult to the slothful man. Everything. Essentially, they can't accomplish anything because everything's too hard. You ever heard that? There's always an excuse. There's always a reason why they can't do what they're supposed to do. And I don't think that it's saying that the way of the slothful man is, is, is necessarily exactly like a hedge of thorns, but it is to him. In his own mind, in his own understanding, everything is too hard to accomplish. We've got a whole lot of people that think that way. Everything's too hard, can never get anything done, can't accomplish anything because there's always too many obstacles and too many tasks. And maybe you or I would look at that situation and think, well, just do this and this and this, you'll be fine. Right? All you do is you do this, you do this, and then you're through. But to them, it's a hedge of thorns. Can't ever get anything done. You know, there are people who will never commit themselves to pray because in their mind, it's a hedge of thorns. It's just too hard. Well, I just work too much. I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. Uh, there, there's this thing that I know that I'm supposed to do, but my way is as a hedge of thorns, and I'm not going to be able to accomplish it because of X, Y, and Z. They try, and by doing that, what they're doing is they're justifying their idleness. Amen? They're justifying their idleness. They're explaining away why it is that they can't accomplish what God has called them to accomplish. Look in chapter 18. I need to move quick. I need to move quickly. I really want to finish this up. 
chapter 18, verse number 9. The Bible says, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. If you are an idle person and you're not applied to labor, uh, it says you're brother to him. It's essentially saying that's another thing you're going to be involved in. You're, you're also going to be uh, a great waster. Look in chapter 19, verse number 15. I want to move quicker through this. Chapter 19, 15. The Bible says, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Look in chapter 19, verse 24. I really want to talk about this. Chapter 19, verse 24. A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom, and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Now, that was a very uh, interesting proverb. Matthew Henry said it about, said like, said, about this verse, this. It says, he hides his hand in his bosom. That's what it says. That he hideth his hand in his bosom. He doesn't want you to know that it's there. He's hiding his hand in his bosom, essentially pretending that he is lame and he cannot work. His hands are cold and he must need warm them in his bosom, and once warm, he must keep them so. I thought that was interesting. John Gill said it this way. It says, uh, it may have respect to such slothful men who are careless and negligent to their soul, who though they have the Holy Scriptures in their hands like a vessel full of wholesome food for the soul, yet will not make use of the least might uh, out of them that they may receive eternal life. I thought that was just a few interesting things about that. Look in chapter 20, verse number 4. Chapter 20, verse number 4. The Bible says, The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore, he shall beg in harvest have nothing. Look in chapter 21, verse number 25. This is something I want to talk about. This was akin to that verse that we looked at earlier. Chapter 21, verse number 25, it says, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Do you know that even those who are slothful, and, and you, you would categorize them as an idle person, that doesn't stop them from having desires. They still want, right? They, they still want a lot of money. They still want a nice house. They still want a nice car. But what kills them is the fact that they are slothful, and therefore they're unwilling to do what is necessary to obtain what they desire. People have this misconception uh, concerning, I'm going to apply it to finances, they have this misconception that the people who are greedy are the people who have money. That's not, I, I don't, I've not noticed that. There are, listen, there are people who are wealthy and they are greedy. But, but you don't have to be rich to be greedy. Amen? I know a whole lot of people that, that don't have a lot and they're just as, if not more greedy than the people who do seem to have something. It has to do with desire. It has to do with desire. Aren't you glad that we live in a country where you can apply yourself and you can make something out of yourself and you can obtain some of those things that you desire? Amen? I'm glad for that. There's a lot of places in this world you can't do that. But we have the opportunity here and we have the desire. But if you do not have the work ethic to meet what you desire, then that desire is going to kill you. That's what the verse is saying, that the desire of the slothful man, it killeth him. It, it tortures him that he can't obtain what he desires, but it is the fact that he is slothful that will leave him in that condition of always desiring, always wanting, but never being able to obtain what it is that they desire. Look in chapter 22. Chapter 22, this one's, this one's kind of funny. Chapter 22, verse number 13. It says, the slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. You thought, you've heard all the excuses in the world. My dog ate my homework. You know, there, all these wonderful excuses. There, there's a lion in the streets. I'm going to be slain. They just, they're, they're worry warded. I mean about that? Look at my mama specifically. She's a worry warden. She just it wouldn't let me cross the street until I was 13 years old, one of those people. I did it. She just didn't know. Uh, but uh, just worry. There's a lion in the streets. I'm just playing. 
but essentially always that there, there's always some impending doom there's all the sky is falling there's always a disaster around every corner there's probably not all right there's probably not okay anyway I thought that was funny look in chapter I'm not gonna go there I've already read another one let's look in chapter 26 I'm gonna skip a couple I'll read one while you're turning in in uh, chapter 26 verse 13 it says the slothful man saith there is a lion in the way a lion in the streets as a door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Like a door turning on his hinges, that's just roll over, right? Alarm clock goes off, what do we do? You just roll over, just like a door on his hinges, right? Just roll over. This is something I wanted to talk about. Verse, uh, chapter 26, verse 16. It says, the slug, y'all see how often this is talked about? The slothful man, the sluggard, all these different terms. Look at verse 26. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Isn't that interesting? What he's saying is that slothful, idle people are very quick to think highly of themselves. He's wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. You know what he's going to do? He's going to point out the flaws and he's going to, to give all of the answers to the people who are actually doing the job that they're not willing to do. It's an armchair quarterback, right? It's a backseat driver. It, it's, it's somebody who's not doing the thing, but they know how to do the thing better than the people doing the thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That He's wiser in his own conceit than seven men who can render a reason, or seven people who actually know what they're doing. There's going to be a whole lot of that going on tomorrow and, and around water coolers across America, right? Those foot, college footballs this weekend, and all across the country, all the water coolers are going to be surrounded by people who really know how they could have won that game. If they'd have done this, if they'd have done that, listen, nobody pays you to do that. You don't know what you're talking about, right? But, but you're wiser in your own conceit than seven people who are paid to do that. Everybody know what I'm talking about? This is a very practical book. Don't you love the Bible? Amen? It just tells you, tell you what it is. But, but what it's saying, people who are not really able and not really willing to do, they're the ones who have all the answers. I've noticed that even in church. Have you noticed that in church? The people who would never do the thing, they know how to do the thing. And they'll tell you. The people who are always have a complaint. Nothing's ever perfect. Well, I'd have done it this way. Well, why did he say that? Why did we buy that? Why is it that color? Just Everybody has their own opinion. Everybody thinks they know the way things are supposed to be done. And yet the people with the strongest opinions are those who do the least work. Amen? Everybody okay with that? That's, that's what this verse is saying. I want to end with this. Look in, look in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll be done. I really feel like we should end. Okay, we'll do it. So we've noticed some points in Proverbs. We're talking about man's disobedience. Every one of these verses, every one of these verses in Proverbs that we looked at had a severe consequence, right? The desire of the slothful man killeth him. There's a consequence. The person who... Uh, is, is idle, he's going to be hungry. His want's going to come like an armed man. There's a, there's a consequence for idleness, right? We've seen that in all of these verses. I want us to look at a wonderful illustration of that. 2 Samuel 11, verse number 1. Y'all know where I'm going with this. 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after the year expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still. You see that? He tarried still. He was being idle. It's the, times when, it's the time when kings go forth to battle. David is supposed to be on the battlefield. But, in still, but instead, he tarries still. And you know what? follows as a result of this idleness. He, he, he gets idle, 
he's supposed to be fighting, but instead the Bible says that he arose from his bed in an evening tide. He, he's sleeping in the evening. He, he, he has no business, even if he didn't go forth to battle, he could have been busy doing something else. But it wasn't just that he didn't go battle, it was that even while he is at home, he was idle. He's getting up out of bed, it's in the evening time. And as a result of his idleness, again, I told you that idleness is a gateway sin. Idleness led forth to lust and to adultery and eventually to murder. It started off with idleness, which is, which is and, and, then it, and then it went forward to, to lust and to adultery. And then he ends up killing a man because he was idle. He, he, first, he first committed a hot-blooded sin in adultery, and then he commits a cold-blooded sin in murder. He kills a man premeditatedly. And you might would say, well, I would never do that. Get idle and find out what you'll do. When you get idle, when I get idle, what we do is we let our guard down. Amen? We get comfortable, we put our feet up, we, 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 we situate ourselves comfortably, and when you do that, you drop the standards that you used to hold. I'm going to give a very, very practical application of that that will prove my point. When you get home and you sit in the recliner and you, you, you pop your feet up, you'll turn things on that television that you wouldn't normally watch. Amen? We were talking about something about this last night. Me and Brother Sambo Drew, Brother Jay, we're talking about this. What we do is we let our guard down, we get comfortable, and by doing that, well, it's not really that bad. I heard an illustration used by Brother Tim Farrar one time along these lines, and he said that if I were to tell you I'm going to come over to your house tonight. I'll use Brother Shane. Brother Shane, me, me and Christian, we're going to come over to y'all's house tonight. We're going to eat and have a good time. And we're going to entertain y'all. Okay? You're going to sit there. We're going to entertain y'all. We're going to stand up, and we're, we'll tell some off-color jokes, probably cuss a little bit, maybe drink a little bit. We're going to do all that in your house. You know what he would tell me? Absolutely not. Right? Wouldn't you? You'd say, no, don't bring that liquor in my house. No, don't, don't bring that language in my house. But we'll get idle. We'll kick our feet up. And we'll turn it on. And we'll do the same thing. That's what I'm talking about idleness being a gateway sin. Because you not only let your physical guard down, you let your spiritual guard down when you get idle. David did it and he ended up committing things he never thought he would do. And if you and I get idle, we'll do the same thing. 